So, hello, dear friends, colleagues out there, followers of Dentist.camera. It's a great pleasure <clears throat> and great honor to have, let's say, my best dental friends with me. Uh, the, only, the only downside, we, we expected also to have Urs Belzer with us. That's why, let's say, in, in honor, and I hope that Pascal agrees, in honor of Urs Belzer and his great work, that he has done. Ah, we have also uh, we have also uh, Javier joining us. Let's let's also welcome Javier to the show. Hello. So, so I put I put also Urs Belzer's name on the screen. Now I blend it out because otherwise we we don't we don't have space <laughs> enough space on the screen. So great having you here. We will also talk a little bit later about Urs Belzer, but. Thanks again for joining the show tonight. A lot of people have waited for this for this live interview. I can tell you the the feedback was huge, and uh, let's jump into that. And uh, Javier and Panos, uh, you uh, <clears throat> they say <laughs> it's it's okay if we start with Pascal <laughs> and yes. then bring bring the <laughs> bring the Padavans bring the Padavans. Yes. I'm also, just here for the decoration. I'm just here for the decoration. <laughs> into, the, into the discussion. So yeah. first, first, Pascal, I know everybody out there knows you in the dental community, but as an introduction at, uh, to the topic, your new book, I, I want that you, that you lose a few words about the history. I know you're, you're originally from Switzerland, now you're in the U.S., Maybe two or three short sentences right. about your way to where you are now, right. Pascal. <laughs> I have a very easy answer to your question, Alessandro. Read chapter eight in my book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because actually, okay. it's funny because uh, I decided, you know, to include uh, in the book a bonus chapter. I call it chapter eight. It's actually after chapter uh, seven, but it's not formally chapter eight. And I call it the whole story. But since you are asking me, uh, I'm going to, in a nutshell, tell you that, uh, you know, I grew up in a, a city called Neuchâtel, but I was born in La Chaux de, La Chaux de Fond, which is the cradle of the watch industry. And, um, you know, I was a very uh, passionate student all my life. I've been a passionate student. I've never... Of course, I got uh, good grades, uh, you know, in school. Usually I had good grades in school, but uh, I was passionate about studying. And, and when I started, uh, you know, looking at professions, I decided, of course, I was influenced by my brother, right? Michel, who was already in dental technology for a long time. Michel did an apprenticeship at age 15, you know, became a dental technician, I think, at age 18 and never stopped uh, doing this job. And Michel, of course, influenced me uh, by sharing his passion when and I was still a college student, of course. But then I spent one week with my dentist in Neuchâtel, and I was fascinated by, by endodontics. And it's funny because today I don't do endodontics, and I'm not particularly fond of endodontics. But when I looked at him doing those little uh, filing and the colors and all the colors of the files and I was totally in awe of this micro world and I said wow let's let's do dentistry but uh, you know I was quickly disappointed when I graduated because of the type of dentistry we learn because it was not what I was expecting in terms of you know um Porcelain fused to metal, uh, crown and bridge, and amalgam was our main, you know, they were our main uh, tools back then. And I almost abandoned to go back to medicine when a miracle happened in 1992. Uh, first miracle, Urs Belzer 
we will talk more about him, but he told me there is this amazing technician in Basel who is looking for a mate dentist to to do cases and lecture together. And his name is Claude Sieber. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, let's do it. So Claude Sieber came to Geneva to meet me. We did about 10 cases together. And I was totally in awe of, of Claude's work, of course. And a second miracle happened when finally my brother opened his own lab in 1992 in Montreux. And we finally could start working together and, and and back then there was no you know like it is today where i cannot work with my brother anymore because of trade trade situation here in america but back then we could work together even though i was at the university and this is when things started to open up in my heart and combine to you know acid etch uh, reinforcement of the cusp by the acid edge technique, which was the other miracle that I read about at that time, and putting all together, that became uh, biomimetic dentistry that you know about. So that's for the the, the, the quick story. If you want to know more, chapter eight. <laughs> great, but uh, you, you this was a great summary of chapter eight for sure. Yes. Yes. I I also want quickly introduce our uh, our let's say our core. Uh, co uh, co workers, I don't know. You you told them contributors to your book, Pascal. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. I have to say, yeah. Let me say that quickly about about Panos and Javier because it's yes. important. I'm zero. I'm really glad they are here because you know, even though um, I came up with my first book with Earth in 2002 with uh, bonded porcelain restoration, right, and biomimetic the concept. But um, I I think that. Meeting uh, first, of course, Panos uh, upon my arrival at USC, meeting him and his passion and, and, and his love for the brothers that was totally reciprocal uh, made uh, an impact and pushed me even more forward, you know. And that's why I'm glad also Javier is here because Javier has also, I, I met Javier much later, but uh, through his uh, uh, skills and amazing skills, uh, Javier has also pushed the, the limits forward. And I want to say I'm glad they are here because the new book also has been influenced by their push, you know, the, the bioemulation group. And I, I will not steal the, the, the definition of bioemulation that will be made by Panos, but... Um, the bioemulation grew up, gave me a, a, an extra stimulation, I have to say. And so when I wrote the new book, uh, Javier uh, offered, you know, a number of his uh, contribution with the, with the videos, with the 3D uh, graphic work. And, and Panos, of course, Panos uh, not only wrote the beautiful foreword, but uh, also you cannot imagine how much Panos stimulated me during the process, which, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it, but writing a book is a roller coaster, right? And it's good to have a friend, my friend Panos there in Greece, who was like, Pascal, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's why I'm glad they are here, because I want to say thank you to both of you, uh, because you cannot imagine how you've been uh, uh, helping me uh, from afar, but you've been helping me and, and you know, I want to hug you virtually here. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We will, we will come back to Panos and uh, Javier in a minute, but uh, let's, let's wrap up the, the history of, uh, of, of, the, of this book writing. So mm. you mentioned 2002. 2002 was the first book. I remember I opened my dental office in 1990. So uh, I, already, I already was uh, a so-called experienced dentist or right. established dentist in my office. And then I saw this book. Um, and uh, it, it, changed, it changed the way we approached uh, many things in dentistry without, without how to say, uh, being too polite to you, Pascal. But um, I think for in 2002, this was really uh, a, a, a revolution, not only in aesthetic dentistry, but 
in restorative dentistry in general. Let's say beside also books from uh, Galip Gurel and other famous authors at that time that really pushed the limit and tried to do new things, uh, bringing, bringing us to a next level and sharing their passion also, their knowledge. So how, how, how did it come that after a short time, you already decided to write together with Urs Belzer. Uh, we have to, we have to uh, yeah. emphasize this. I think the, the man behind the book or pushed you also to do the book together mm -hmm. was Urs. Or yeah. how, well, how, how it, did this first book happen? Right. Now, I, okay. It's interesting. Uh, the first book happened because and you will be maybe a little bit disappointed by my answer, but the repeated and repeated requests of, of Mr. Haze and Quintessence Publishing. <laughs> so, and, but, but here's what I have to say. So, so I was, it, it is a package, you know, I was working at my PhD or Privat Dozent, uh, it's a it's a Germanic title, you know, Privat Dozent that doesn't exist uh, in many places in the world. But Doctor Belzer, Professor Belzer, my mentor, my dental father, how I call him, really uh, pushed me for this uh, uh, title, right? The Privat Dozent, which is a really the highest uh, title you can get in, in, in Swiss academia, uh, Swiss and German academia. And so I worked on that as soon as I returned from my uh, research uh, um, time in Minnesota. Uh, Dr. Belzer made it clear that would have been the priority. And you know, the PhD is a very scientific presentation. So simultaneously to that, I worked at the book that was the clinical presentation. So it was really a nice combination to do the PhD in a more scientific way and do the book in a more clinical way. So I had two documents there, one scientific, one more clinical. Of course, the book is also scientific, but the priority was really to help the, cl the clinician with the book. The PhD was a scientific endeavor. So that's how it happened. But, but here's the point. Dr. Belzer, Professor Belzer, really created the climate and the condition for that to happen. And this is where I have to, to really uh, bow down <laughs> before him and say, thank you, Earth. Thank you for, for allowing that and helping me and facilitating me and guiding me like a father would do for a son. That's the point. And that's how we came with the first book, which was a miracle because it would have been impossible to achieve maybe in other environments where I would have been you know, pushed for uh, more uh, uh, productivity in other fields of the academia. So just one question <clears throat> regarding the book and the amazing photography in the book. A lot of people are always asking me if we talk about dental photography, oh, how, how did they in 2002, and uh, this was, uh, I guess, 99% of the images in the book are analog slides, slides. Yeah, yeah, that absolutely. have been scanned. Yeah, uh, exactly. I also know that uh, Urs and, and also yourself at that time were big fans of uh, 60 millimeter macro lens, mm -hmm. which, uh, which was great for anterior photography, not so great for, for let's say, take was, pictures of yeah. full arch, but maybe at that time created this special effect. I, I just call it special <laughs> effect of a lot of, a lot of your images look very artistic, which was something new to that time. Have you been influenced by Claude Sieber? Yeah, of course, absolutely. I mean, Claude Sieber and his photography, you know, and his books have, have deeply imprinted me because he was really the first one I saw taking a black background and putting it in the mouth of the patient. I had never seen that before in 1991. And I thought, wow, now that's how he does it. You know, he came in Geneva with all these little 
black pieces of fabric cut in advance and he would put that behind the teeth and I was like okay <laughs> and uh, then uh, quick uh, enough everybody was doing the, the, the same you know so of course but his light reflections pictures and transillumination and stuff like that but you know what my main tool was back then you say the special effect I wouldn't say it's the lens or the camera my main tool to make most of the spectacular pictures in the first First book was a giant light table that we used to look at radiographs and I put that light table vertically on my office desk and I use it as the backdrop so this light coming from the front and that's how I took the pictures of the cover with a giant light table a tripod <laughs> and a, a little piece of black background at the bottom of the light table so that you would see black in the background and not the main white uh, source of light. And, and that's it. This giant, big, vertically placed light table was my tool. And most of the pictures were taken uh, like that. And still in the new book, there are a few of those pictures I kept because, to be honest with you, even though it was on a tripod with a slide, they are still as good as what we can do today. Absolutely. So before we jump, before we jump into the next chapter of your of your writing career, I would I would to give the word to Panos and Javier. Maybe Panos, you can tell us a little bit more about meeting meeting Pascal for the first time. Pascal was telling when he went from Switzerland to 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 the U.S. and you already have been there. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. I completed my dental education in the year 2000. I began USC at 1996. Well, when I met Pascal, I was a fan of Pascal before I met Pascal, because by chance I happened to stumble upon a copy of uh, the first edition, the Biomimetic Restorative Porcelain Edition, Interior Edition, in 2002. So I was, I, was, uh, I was at crossroads with uh, my uh, clinical career. I was not satisfied with uh, my work. And uh, I took so much inspiration out of his, his book. And, I, and to this day, you know, I can't thank him enough. But funny enough, and I think Pascal remembers, Pascal, I sent you an email before you matriculated at USC. Do you remember that? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, we had never met, and I sent him an email. I congratulated <laughs> him. I told him how much value my education would have for him matriculating to my alma mater. Um, another interesting point is that uh, when I was flying to the United States back in 2004, I was flying on the same flight with Michelle. We were, we were connecting wow. because I was connecting through Geneva, and we spent New Year's Eve over Las Vegas together without knowing it. And this came out in the future. And then I met Pascal at the university and just it, it, it altered my career. It altered my thinking. It shaped me as I am. Uh, he was a, a brother and a mentor from the first moment. Uh, it's a very Star Wars relationship that we have, you know, and I, I'm happy to see that he has a, a Lambda class behind him right there, an Imperial shuttle in the background. Yes. <laughs> very nice. uh, may the force be with us. It's it's just been a roller coaster, and uh, you know, and uh, I had to depart. I departed in 2007, but we kept in close contact, and and you know, I just wanted to impress my mentor. And uh, bioemulation is a tribute to him and Michelle, the whole group. You know, it wouldn't exist if if Pascal didn't really give us the fire, and he, he's been a big contributor. And and through and this is amazing because because of Pascal, I have amazing friends like Javier and yourself because. If I wasn't passionate about what I did, dentistry has connected me with such a, an a incredible network of, of, of people. That's why my, my favorite chapter is chapter eight, Alpha Omega, because it shows the human version behind an amazing clinician, you know, which I knew it, but many other people didn't know. So I am thankful uh, on, a, on an academic level because he altered my life. I'm thankful on a personal level because he's made me a better person. And uh, just congratulations on, on Urs and Pascal for, for continuing the saga. It's like the next trilogy, you know? It's like, we love it. Keep it coming. You know? <laughs> <laughs> great. Thank great. you, Panos. Couldn't, couldn't have said this better. So, um, uh, Javier, what, what about you? Uh, Pascal was mentioning that he met you a little bit later in, uh, in, uh, in his career. 
So uh, how did you how did you get in touch with uh, with each other? Well, it was actually through through Panos that that we got in touch. Um, I I met Pascal first in in um, in Greece. There was a congress there with Panos. Uh, of course, I knew him before. I'm uh, I can say that uh, I w I was born in dentistry with with almost with the publication of his book, right? So because I graduated at the same time, so. Uh, that was immediately something that inspired me a lot in, in, the, in the way to see dentistry. And I was lucky that uh, actually my father uh, bought this book immediately when it was released. And uh, I get to, to, to read it. And, and of course, it was uh, something incredible. But, but uh, I, I would like to thank Pascal for the, for the opportunity to, to really uh, put some... Uh, some of my work there in the book, I think it was an amazing opportunity uh, to to share and to and uh, and I think it's the minimum that uh, I could do for uh, the contribution of of because he he gave us so much. Uh, it's it's not only about the knowledge, but it's also about how much he he was inspiring all of us and uh, and to different levels, right? So for me, it's uh, it's of course much more than just dentistry and and and. As, as a human being, I think uh, is very, very special. You're very special, Pascal. And I think you inspire a lot of people. And, and that's, that's really amazing. And, uh, and, and really, I mean, I don't have words really to, to <laughs> express myself. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's so difficult to, to really express uh, the, the, the love and uh, the really the, how, how much this is uh, meaning for me. And, and, and also, thank you very much, Panos, for, for uh, starting this over with, with Pascal, because you two guys were, were really starting the, the biomulation thing. And if it, it's, it's the beginning of, of all this story uh, for me. And uh, I, I am so glad that uh, I had the opportunity to meet you guys. And thank you so much. Before we before we jump into the book, we will do a, a little detour because between the first book and the second book, it's almost 20 years. That's a generation. That's almost one generation. <clears throat> so um, also from my side, Pascal, you, you, are, you are one of the few dentists, educator, mentors that never put their ego in front. So this is something, and this is something that I trying, think you learned also. <laughs> you learned also from Urs Belzer, because I always say Urs Belzer for me was one or is one of the last grand seigneur mm -hmm. in dentistry. So right. always very down to earth, never saying, "Wow, uh, how cool am I? How great am I? How good am I?" Because uh, <clears throat> I once wrote uh, an editorial with the title, I am the best. Mm. And you know about this, uh, this, this awards, uh, I'm, I'm one of the top 100 uh, dentists on right. the world and whatever. Right. And right. I, my answer to all this is always, there's only one person who gives you an award. It's your patient. Mm -hmm. Only your patient That's tells absolutely. you, Pascal, Dr. Manje, you're the best for me. And right. another one says, Pano, do, do, pa, dear, dear Dr. Batsos, you're the best for me. Right. And this is our award we, are, we have to look for, to seek for. And this is never happen if you just uh, put your ego too much out there. Yeah. And this is the connection I see between you, Pascal, and Urs Belzer. So I, and mm. I don't know if you agree that you learned a lot also to be down to earth yes to work hard yes and totally. and and communicate be open uh, totally. share your knowledge and try to bring things forward not keeping things just by yourself and saying i don't tell anybody how i'm doing this i want it, i want to be the best and i, I never mm -hmm. tell anybody about my right. my my secrets so right um, right no you i mean you know uh, uh the, 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 the Greek uh, thinkers, right? Uh, I mean, if you think about the word academia, academia means, to me, means like uh, almost like family, you know, academia is, and that's what Dr. Belzer really taught me. Excuse me, I tend to say doctor, I should say professor, because here, here in the United States, the term doctor has actually more value than the, the term professor. So, uh, Earth, 
really represent uh, uh, what I call the academia, you know, the academic thinking. And uh, exactly uh, uh, what you said, you know, he places the patient in the center, right? The patient has to be placed in the center of our decisions. And so when we design research, when we design teaching, when we design, it's, it's the patient who should be at the, at the center. And I agree with you. The patient is the ultimate uh, evaluator. And that's why uh, one of the, my favorite picture in the book is a letter from a patient here in the United States that was written in French. He was a French uh, a francophone patient and uh, I translated of course for the, the readers and and the words to me are the most important in this letter is you know I said thank you for what you're doing for the patients but also for educating the next generation of dentists and this is priceless to me this is the price it's not the uh, thousands of followers on, on Instagram it's you know ultimately the patient uh, when a patient cries on the chair because of what you did for them, not not necessarily because it's uh, it's uh, it, it looks great, but because you saved the tooth, because you they feel your passion and love for the profession. That is priceless. I agree with you, hundred percent on that. And the problem with new generations today, it's more about the you know the 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 likes, uh, the followers and the likes and all that stuff. So it's it's interesting because I know you, Alessandro, now you are going very strong in that direction. <laughs> but on the other side, for the young generation, it's a big double edge uh, sword, right? And so we have to be careful because a, a lot of young people are actually harmed <laughs> by uh, this new ego uh, driven uh, 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 society and 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 media uh, aggressiveness of the media. So I think it's important to go back to the roots, back to the values, and that's why uh, all of us here know how much uh, I value the spiritual side of of life. Because you know I can be only one person i'm not multiple personality at least that uh, what i know of but um and so my uh my soul is really uh deeply connected uh, to the spiritual to the to, to to god and and god keeps you on earth you know so of course i have to thank earth uh, belzer because of his humility and 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 he taught me how to to be like that but Obviously, my greatest mentor for that is God. And, and God also taught me humility <laughs> extensively, I can tell you that. Absolutely. And even Absolutely. as I was writing the second book, uh, <laughs> he taught me great humility. And, 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 and Panos is my witness. We had some phone conversation during the writing where I really needed also a human being to lift me up. And, and Panos, that's what you did. Before we go back to the book, let's let's talk about uh, the, the the words that are floating around uh, in mm. the last years: yeah. uh, biomimetics, bioemulation, right. all this. And I think uh, we have we have uh, the right people here, and yes. especially Panos. Panos, uh, I would really love you to share what bioemulation is all about. Uh, I, I know, or I'm following this group. I'm a proud member of this group, very proud member of this group, uh, being part of the Swiss bioemulation group. Uh, <laughs> but uh, this, uh, <laughs> we already two here from the Swiss bioemulation group. Exactly. But tell, tell us a little bit, because uh, bioemulation, biomimetics plays also an important role in the second book of Pascal Manier. So maybe you give us uh, a short a short introduction into the topic before we jump into the book. Okay. Well, biomimetics is a fantastic term, and you know you can look it up a little bit more. And essentially, it's uh, being inspired by uh, nature, and um, you can use it in cross translational applications. Uh, bio bio biomimetics is a word that has been a little bit commercially overused. I felt with Pascal at, at a certain point. There was also a tennis racket by a certain company that they, you can look it up. They call it the biomimetic tennis racket. I don't, and it's, it's a famous <laughs> company too. 
so so we were having a conversation. He's, uh, Pascal was like, oh, Panos, did you see this? Oh, my God, look, a tennis mm -hmm. racket. It's my automatic. And I'm like, maybe we should come up with a better term or, or something that differentiates us, right? So it was it was bios, which is a Greek uh, word for it's a compound word, obviously bios for life, and emulate emulare, which to rival to rival life or to rival nature. So it's not that one one supersedes the other. If you look at some of our publications with Pascal, it's biomulation, semicolon, biomimetically emulating nature. You know, so right. I think that's I think that's the um, the the driving force behind the whole conversation, whether it's biomimetics or bioemulation. Bioemulation has an extensive scope that it's also a social group. It's a, it's a social ecosystem that introduces dentists and dental technologists and material scientists. So it's more like a community that likes to talk about biomimetics and how it relates to dentistry. So for me, it's not a confusing term. It's more of a term of distinction. And it's, you cannot buy into this, uh, this group. No, no, no amount of money can get you in the group. It's, it's a peer-to-peer it's -peer kind of, you know, uh, association. So, and it's built on honesty and trust, ethos, integrity, emulation. And uh, like every other group, uh, you do have members coming and going. There is natural attrition. But I think that's very organic and I think it's needed. But at the same time, it's a stimulation for the younger generation. And I think, honestly, and I'm saying this on live, uh, uh, online, uh, we're gonna we're gonna expand the group. The second book right now, the second volumes are, are I mean they they, they were sold out in a matter of what a month. Everything was gone off the shelves. Obviously, this shows us that there is profound interest, and maybe it's time that we should be opening up the group a little bit more to people so they can be part of this. And and this has been a confirmation, Pascal. Mm -hmm. This has been a confirmation. Maybe many people thought the group was living in obscurity, but it's not. It's very active. It's very alive. But now maybe it's time that we become a little bit more ecumenical and we're a little bit more inclusive. So yes, yes. Uh, we're, we're working on this right now. You know? so, and let me also uh, mention Sasha Hein, who is not with us today, but who really uh, uh, made a, a major contribution with, you know, the the color uh, uh, color uh, matching aspect with the eLab. And, and I think that's also something that is in, in the new book. And I want to really uh, thank Sasha here uh, above all. And Sasha is a, is a great guy. He has, a, he has so much passion <laughs> for for what he's doing you know i always say when people ask me you know the common denominator in the biomilation group is really passion and love passion and love for for what we do and and sasha is a very strong element with uh, his passion and love for what he does and 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 communicate it so uh thank you sasha if you are listening and 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 You've been uh, an amazing member of the of the group, and thank you for your contribution to the book too. So let's jump into the book, and then uh, we can make another round uh, with with also with Javier. Now almost twenty years. So first question, or let's say mm. two questions. Why mm. did it take twenty years to do <laughs> another book? Uh, no, because usually yeah, you yeah, write, yeah, you write, yeah, yeah. you write, no, you, write to tell you. you write, you write a book, and let's say um, every book, if it's written, it's already outdated. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. So, uh, so I, I, I would, I would expect an update every five years. So you skipped, yes. you skipped yeah. some updates on the book and did, uh, let's say, a major update after right. twenty years. Right, right. So, so what has changed? Uh -huh. over the last 20 years right. so i right. think i think i i had a sneak peek uh, uh -huh. i, I yes. didn't i didn't have the time to read all all the book mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's it's huge it's a large amount of information i was just browsing a little bit the most important aspects also some of the some of the work is uh, is already published by you by yourself and your your group from the university so studies on uh, how to be less invasive and so on. So, but to the point, what is the yeah, major yeah. difference between right, 2002 right. and 2020? Yeah, 20? yeah. So, so first you ask 20 years. So 20 years, yeah, because it took 
uh, another wave of pushes from Quintessence to tell me, hey, you need an update, you need an update. So my publisher was really anxious to get an update. But yeah, first, it took so long because I think the first book I tried when we, when we wrote the first book, you know, we tried to make it the least uh, aging possible, right? So that was, I would say, before the second book came, I would say, yeah, it's still 80% valid and 20% needs an update. So the new book, really, what is changing the new book? Basically, uh, it's the um, adaptation to the, the, the times, right? The, the times of these two decades that have changed. We seek that we've been through a lot in the world. We've been through a lot with this pandemic. So we see that uh, the first book was maybe a little bit more specific about bonded porcelain restorations, which requires uh, the participation of an amazing lab, amazing technician, high level ceramics. And, and, and that is that doesn't come cheap, right? So for the second book, I want it to be more inclusive and also, you know, looking at a wider range of, of solutions, much more solutions. I like, by the way, another book that was published by Veneziani called Solutions. And, and, and I love this title, Solutions, because in, in, the, in Biomimetic Restorative Dentistry, the new book, we have expanded the the, the more conservative options. We have expanded about the, the composite, the direct composite. We have included the posterior dentition also, again, to be more inclusive. The first book was focused on anterior teeth. So now we have anterior and posterior uh, dentition and, and the semi-direct, semi-indirect approaches to give you a more extended armamentarium to cover uh, the, the clinical situation according to the need and possibilities of the patient. So that, that's really what's new in the, in the new book uh, on top of updating what was the existing content, which significant updates, it was to add uh, those elements that I just mentioned. So biomimetics has not changed per se, but what I would say is we have adapted to the need of the society and, and the evolution of this society and the, the need for also serving all type of patients, you know. So that's why I love the back cover of the book where it says science, yes, experience, yes, common sense, but above all the patient must be in the center, you know, because all these things, science Common sense experience can tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, patient needs a $50,000 full mouth rehabilitation, but the patient has only $3,000. Uh, do you just reject the patient? No, you adapt. You adapt to the need of the patients. And that's my point here. Uh, opposing to the first book, that was more maybe, you know, uh, 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 elite style with these amazing master dental technicians. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would jump over to Javier. I, I see, I see uh, an ongoing discussion, an interesting discussion, ceramic versus composite. <laughs> and uh, and it, many, for many years, I saw the, 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 the stars on stage uh, saying, oh, there's only ceramic. Composite is for the masses, is for cheap dentistry. This is not what I would uh, put in my hands or what I never will put in the mouth of my patients. They only deserve full crowns, 32 crowns uh, because Hollywood and whatever. And I think Javier, Panos, and also yourself, you are your example of, of the shift. It's not, it's like uh, comparing, uh, I remember some years ago, uh, the, you went on a conference and they were asking you, are you placing implants, Dr. De Vigos? I say, no, I'm not. At that time, I did not place implants. Aha, uh -huh. so you're a bad dentist. You know what I mean? So the valuation of what you're doing and who you are. And I think today, I must say, carious periodontitis are still the number one things, the, the diseases we have to cure. 
and in in carriers in in the in the prevention or in fighting carriers prevention is the is would be the key but then i think composite has become the most um, the most important uh, restorative material and i would i would ask javier about the the latest developments uh, changing also the the the, the concept of colors and everything. Maybe you can lose a few words about the evolution of composite and, and, and the, let's say the decrease in, in ceramic or how you see that in the context also of the, of the new book of Pascal. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a very interesting topic, definitely. Uh, how I see the future is that definitely composite is going to take more and more space mm -hmm. in in our lives uh, it's um, i think it's clear that uh, patients have better oral health and uh, prevention is is working also better so the first line of treatment will be always a very minimum invasive uh, therapy and uh, this is what we experience now i mean a lot of patients after orthodontics after small uh, things they they just want small corrections uh, small things and 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 we need to help with with minimum invasive treatment and and of course the more we prep we know that this is not going to be good for the patient on the long term so uh, also i'm concerned about all this these elder patients that we have uh, we will have in, in that they are have they, they really have all their teeth perfectly uh maintained during all their lives and then suddenly uh, when they get a little bit older you start having more issues because there is less saliva there is more uh, you know, the ability to clean is also lower. So it's eventually we start having some, some more issues there, you know, too, that we need to fix with restorative. So I think that the restorative is here to, to stay and composite is here to stay. And uh, the materials have evolved so much, so much that I'm really sure that uh, we will see a very, very bright future. And I think that also the connection of the digital, you know, and the 3D printing together with the composites is going to be a, a game changer in the future it will help us a lot and and this is this is how i see my patients ask for less and less and less invasive therapies and that's where composites shines because you don't really need to to prep you know i mean we can discuss a lot about how much you prep i know a lot of people say no no but i i do veneers without prep but you know <laughs> If you really want to do, to do things in a, in a proper aesthetic way with the profiles, with there are some cases where, yes, you can do just no prep and other cases that it's very complicated and you need a very, very skilled uh, uh, technician behind you, perhaps that does like uh, platinum foil or does, you know, and all these things together. It's not that easy and not that mainstream that everybody can can have access to. So we need to think about the people, patients, you know, and and. As Pascal said, not everybody has the money to, to afford a very, very high-end treatment. So composite is affordable, yes, is our time, is our time that we need to put to help the patient to look better, to have a better health, oral health. And I think it's an amazing tool because it's not expensive, but it helps us a lot to achieve this task. But the only thing is that it, it requires probably more, more training right? More knowledge about how yes. to work with it, how to obtain the, the best results. But the materials nowadays are amazing. They're amazing. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and the, uh, the CAD yeah. CAM composites, as you mentioned, there's also something that was, it took a long time, you know, until 2001, there was just the first composite block came in 2001 with 3M, right? And now we have a, a, a lot of choices for composite block. That's a very good evolution, I think, with CAT CAM because the other thing that you could criticize in the direct composite arena is that it's, it requires a lot of skill and training, like you just say, Javier, right? And some people are not ready to spend the, the time and, and skill. And so now I love this idea of semi-direct and semi-indirect that gives you a little bit 
another possibility here. And I think this is where I see we could we could have a great, great, you know, I always tell my brother, if you would do those semi-direct, like uh, customized veneers, you can produce so many <laughs> veneers a day compared to, you know, refractory veneers to make them more affordable and, and, and still something absolutely amazing. Uh, have you, what we learn, and I'm sure you agree, is also the repairability of, of those restoration is huge. Absolutely. And we know now from science <laughs> that repair is better than replace. Actually, it's not worse for sure. That's we know. It's not worse to repair than to replace. So that's another big advantage. And the simplification, huh, Javier, when you, your, uh, your involvement with Essencia is a perfect example. I, will, I always use uh, GCS as the best example of ultra simplification in composite restorations. That, I love that. I love this provocative simplification of, <laughs> of Essencia because it, it's pushing to the extreme. And the, the last thing I want to say to support Javier in his statement is that I had a really interesting encounter uh, maybe 10 years ago with an individual called Nick Opdam. And Nick Obdam is a professor in, in, uh, in, in Holland. And he was attacking me uh, quite aggressively for my indirect upgrade. Said, Pascal, why do you do indirect restorations? Here we do everything direct, you know, because it fits also better the social system in Holland and, and, and lots of patient uh, affordability problems. So direct, big direct. And he published this study in 2010, I think, where they compared lots large, really large composites that I would never have dared tried to amalgam restoration comparison. And, and even those large composites worked amazing. Uh, you know, things we, ne we would never dare to do because of shrinkage, right? But they were doing there. And, and the results were totally shocking. And so it encouraged me, I have to say, personally, when I talked to Nick of that, we ended up becoming friends, you know, because he accepted also that there were some advantages using indirect restorations. And, and he became also a big fan of deep margin elevation technique. We ended up writing an article together. So that was really the funny part. But to tell you that we can do much more with the rate composite that we originally thought we, we could do. Yeah. So Absolutely. <clears throat> and uh, it's it. Well, um, I state this also. We are now looking for controlled failures. Yeah. So yeah. that uh, if a patient right. has a chipped tooth, you replace it with composite, telling the patient maybe tomorrow you come back and it's chipped right. off again because in, right. during the night you, you broxed it off. But, exactly. uh, uh, but you can do it again and again and you can, you can bond this 20 times without, without causing any damage mm -hmm. to the tooth. Yeah. And, um, no, and I of course, it's not going to be needed 20 times, but, but, no, for, no. <laughs> sure, but for sure, the, the fact, you know, I, when I see trauma cases, I'm so happy when I see a trauma case where an existing composite simply fractured in the composite. And to me, this is like the best news you can have because you can redo another composite. You didn't lose any tooth structure, right? Well, we know that with ceramic veneers, uh, things are going to fracture more not like a natural tooth. You can have oblique fractured in the direction of the root, right? Because ceramics, even though we use the weakest ceramics, right, on the market, like feldspathic, is still stronger than enamel. That's the that's the, the thing. And so you see the modulator, I see composite as a modulator of strength. I like that a lot. Absolutely, and it fits also the, the biomimetic concept published yes. by, by Panos, Javier, right. yourself, Sasha, uh, uh, let's say out of the bioemulation group, this, this concept you know, of stratification. Yeah. Uh, if that you would the, ask me, what is the, if I would choose only one material to restore to, composite would be the material because it has, if you think about it, 
uh, composite resin is quite miraculous. It has the flexibility of dentin and it has a wear resistance, which is not too bad compared to enamel. And that, that combination, uh, this is basically what we expect from dentin and enamel. We expect the flexibility of dentin and we expect the wear resistance of enamel to keep the shape and function. And, and that's what composites are able to achieve in a very, very reasonable way. And that's why I see, that's why I wanted to emphasize that aspect in the, in, the, in the new book, really, because that's a little bit what I came to realize during those 20 years of, of, of lab time. But, but Alessandro, Panos, and Javier, if you ask me today, which of the restoration I believe has the most beautiful aging and, 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 and durability if this is the criteria, of course, a beautifully bonded porcelain veneer. You will never see. I, I see the cases I, I, I've done with Michelle 20, 30 years ago. And it's like, wow. I will never show you a composite that looks like this 25 years later. I will never be able. This we have to recognize. But doesn't mean that should be the only goal we have. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. But, but this was the perfect, the perfect uh, words to the end, because now I, I want to do a, a final round that uh, what always concludes my life interviews with, uh, with a question that now goes out to, to the three of you. What advice can you give to young colleagues out there? Okay, Pascal, you can tell them, buy my book. <laughs> go and get go and get my book but i think it's yeah. uh, it's beyond that no. so yeah 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 no, no. Maybe, maybe we maybe we start with 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 javier and uh, and go from to panos and uh, give pascal then the, the the last the last comment on this so uh, javier what what's what we have also different generations in dentistry so from the graduation so what do you mean i'm the old one here no, no, I'm the old one. <laughs> I'm, I'm the old one. <laughs> but it's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like it's like red wine. The older yeah. it gets, the better, you know. But uh, some when it's that when it's too old, mm, okay. But forget about this, Javier. What is what is your advice to For to me. young colleagues out there? Yeah, I think that the most important thing is to to stay humble, to stay uh, uh, eager to learn and to keep improving every day. Uh, and uh, of course, put, put the patient in the center of, of, the, of the decisions and, and think uh, uh, for the patient as, as if, if you think for yourself, right? for what, what are you going to do in your own mouth? This is, this is what you need to think for the patient. In, in, just keep this these values because uh, this is this is what we need to to really keep, and and this is the way to to do a honest and um, and I think is the best industry within the limitations of everyone, uh, material, skills, uh, resources. Just be honest and be and and try to do what you do to to your your brother, your sister, to your father. Okay, that's that's what you need to do. Perfect. Panos? Yeah, for, for the young colleagues, I would say uh, to remain scientifically curious, create a critical thinking abilities. Um, definitely love your vocation or fall in love with your vocation. And above all, for a young colleague, what I recommend is get a fantastic mentor involved in your life early on. Uh, I have been blessed with uh, mentors. Uh, today, I can say that I perhaps have mentees as well. So it's a progression, it's a succession, it's an evolution, and you know we need to continue it, definitely. Great. So Perfect. Pascal, yeah, no, I love I love what you you said. I can only agree, and if I can add my little contribution to that, I would say that to the young generation, the challenge for you that we might not have had so strong when we were your age is, is to focus, you know focus and i tell my students find your baby you know find your baby in dentistry what is your baby is that thing 
that you know imagine when you are a parent right you get the you have this little baby and and you this is your it's it's your little baby you want to you want to grow this little baby you, you your responsibility is to grow this amazing gift that you have received your baby is your gift so take that gift that god gave you god gives everybody gifts and remember this gift is a responsibility you have a gift for some it will be i don't know it will be more in ando or in perio i don't know and and to be honest it's not important the most important is you know you have this gift and you have to grow that gift like your little baby and and mature it and focus on that gift you know don't get distracted because one thing i've learned from a very very famous assessment i did together with my wife as a couple we did it it's called strength finder by gallup and strength finders the principle is that you will never be as good developing your weaknesses as you will be developing your strength right so focus on that baby that is called your strength your gift that god gave you focus on that baby don't let yourself be distracted distracted only a few individuals have the capacity of having many babies <laughs> i don't know many people but i have a friend in switzerland uh, his name is jean pierre ebner in basel and he is good in endo he's good in perio he's good in pros he's good in aesthetic dentistry this guy is amazing he has so many babies that he grew up but most of us we, we can have one maybe two babies that we can grow decently so focus on those babies grow them and, and and you know like babies have grandfather too that's like panos was saying and the, the grandfather is your mentor so you need a mentor and and as javier said stay humble but i think when you have babies it, it's also teaching you to stay humble anyway so that's my advice to you you know look at what god gave you god gave you a talent you have a talent even though some people try to tell you you have no talent no that's wrong you have talent and you have to find this baby that it was gifted to you that's my advice so thank you very much for this very uh, open and uh, kind words to end our live interview i i want to thank you very much uh, a special thank you goes out also to Urs Belzer. He didn't he didn't join us, but I think we will um, we will send him this video, and I hope that he will watch it. Yes. And uh, and and we 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 accept his decision not to be uh, live in in such a show, uh, but this doesn't mean that we appreciate and estimate what he has done for for dentistry for 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 uh, for our careers i i just missed urs when i came to the university of zurich he was just he was just about to leave to geneva i remember that uh, that uh, peter scherer forced him to uh, to go to geneva i think at the age of 35 so <laughs> it was it was a, a crazy crazy yeah. time in Zurich with uh, Carlo Marinello, Jörg Strub, uh, all these all these guys working together uh, in the department of Peter Scherer. So I was re really lucky to see all these people growing up. I still have a crown in my mouth. I had a, I had a, a cusp breakdown when I was a student, maybe because of the stress during the exams. <laughs> and then uh, Carlo Marinello, Carlo Marinello made me a crown. Uh, I was, I, I, it was about 10 sessions um, at that time, uh, Alvin Schoenenberger <laughs> did the crown. I, I think he did 10 crowns un until uh, Carlo was happy with the crown. And at the end, the, 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 the framework was so thin that on the surface, there was the, the oh, there's only uh, feldspath ceramic. And I remember at that time, <laughs> Carlo was telling me, Oh, Alessandro, don't buy too hard on this crown. And I tell you what, this was 37 years ago. The crown is still there, 
I don't oh, fight no. on that crown. <laughs> My habit is everything that is hard goes on the other side because I'm still afraid. I'm still afraid that this crown will break. Oh, no. <laughs> one day, one day it will break. But uh, now it's 37 years. So um, that's fantastic so. <laughs> story. <laughs> so, but I, th I, I think I wish you all the best for Thank the you. Christmas season. Uh, we wish you all that this uh, pandemic situation will will be over one day. Um, I don't want to talk about this. I want to don't want to discuss this this topic. <laughs> but again. Yeah. A special thank you to all of you, to the bioemulation group. I really feel inspired by not only Pascal, by Panos, by Javier, by Sasha, by all the members of this group. I think uh, we, should, we should present ourselves a little bit more, expose ourselves a little bit more, because people are waiting for our input to the dental community. And again, a special thank you also to Urs Pelzer, I will send him the link that he can watch this video. Special greetings also to his wife, Pascal. You know that um, Urs Belzer's wife was, uh, was a teacher of my wife. It was very funny <laughs> that we realized that many years ago when, when my wife was saying, ah, look, this is Christine. Uh, I don't know what the name was, uh, her, her maiden name was. And then said, ah, this is the wife of Urs Belzer. And so this was also a funny right. story how we right. get connected right. with each other. So stay safe, stay healthy, have a great time. And I will be sure, sure that our paths will cross. This is the way. Panos, please show us the book because you made into introduction, you made this, uh, this, cool, this cool move with the book. I, I, want, I want to see that again. So that's in slow motion. Thank in you. Slow motion. Come on. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I'm still waiting for my copy, but uh, the three of you <laughs> waving, waving, waving the book. That's, that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So thank, thank you very you. much. Please thank stay for a moment. Central. I will just end the broadcast, uh, do the outro, and uh, let's talk to you for, for a second. So uh, stay tuned thank for a, for a second. Bye-bye. Uh, Take care. Thank you.